All right, I think we've hit our witching hour. So thank you all again for joining us. We're so grateful that you're here um, for this evening's um, panel as part of our um, uh, Learning Through Languages program, reaching out to teachers and language educators across the state of North Carolina. My name is uh, Kevin Fogg. I'm the Associate Director of the Carolina Asia Center. And I wanna welcome you on behalf of all of the UNC and Duke Area Study Centers that are co-sponsoring this panel this evening. We have a fantastic group to discuss tonight, but I do want to let you know that this is not the only session we've got this week. Some of you will be teachers who are sponsoring uh, student teams and learning through languages. And we look forward to seeing some of y'all um, tuning into the live stream of the awards ceremony for that tomorrow afternoon at four to celebrate what our students across North Carolina are doing um, in classes for Chinese, Japanese, uh, German, French, and Spanish. Um, we've got another expert panel on Thursday night that'll look at uh, heritage learning and uh, dual language immersion. And that'll be chaired by my colleague from uh, the North Carolina Department of Education, Dr. Anne Marie Gunter. And we're thankful that NCDPI is our co sponsor for this series. But tonight we've got a conversation about supporting less commonly taught language teaching here in North Carolina, and we've assembled a great group for it. Our chair this evening is Professor Ruth Gross, who's joining us from North Carolina State University where she is department head and professor of German. Professor Gross, can I hand it over to you to introduce the panel and to get us Absolutely. rolling this evening? Absolutely. Um, yes, all right, I'll, I'll introduce the panel first that I have a couple of introductory words and I didn't know where, where to put those first. So let me introduce the panel first. Um, I'm very, very pleased that we have such a, a, a lively panel here today. One of our participants, I don't know if he's made it in or not, so we'll, I'll hold him till the end. First, let me introduce Leslie Baldwin, who is uh, the World Program Man uh, World Languages Program Manager at Winston Salem Foresight Community College uh, County Schools. I'm sorry, an adjunct instructor in the Department of Education at Wake Forest University. She's the author of Keys to the Classroom, a handbook for beginning world language educators, and she runs innovative programs for her district in less commonly taught languages at the Systems Career Center. Martha McCabe is uh, our, second, our second panelist, and she's a visiting lecturer in Czech at the UNC Chapel Hill. She's founder and president of the Czech and Slovak School of North Carolina and an ESL teacher at Durham Tech Community College. She spent six years as a research associate at the Charles University in Prague and knows a lot about Slavic languages. Uh, Mike Turner, is a colleague. From, uh, he and I work together on the lang language exchange, which we'll talk about probably in a little bit. Mike Turner is an assistant professor of Arabic in the Department of World Languages and Cultures at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. He works on theoretical and applied linguistics and teaches all levels of Arabic. He's particularly interested in historical processes that lead to dialect, dialect diversities. And as I said, he is on the executive committee of the UNC Language Assembly that oversees our UNC Language Exchange, which is an instrument that allows UNC students at any of the 17 institutions in the system to take language classes offered online or via teleconference at any of the other system institutions. And this has been a way that the system itself has been able to extend the teaching, not only of less commonly taught languages, but of languages in general. And we are very grateful that that has worked out so well. It's been in effect now about 10 years. And uh, if anyone has questions about that, I know Mike and I can certainly speak to that later on. Well, welcome to our discussion on the teaching of less commonly taught languages in North Carolina. I know that for all of us, sometimes it feels like today in many communities throughout the US, all languages are less commonly taught than they should be. But this is less commonly taught is a designation that is used specifically as an opposition to the supposedly commonly taught languages like Spanish, French, and German. So these are the languages like Chinese, Russian, Arabic, Bengali, Hindi, Portuguese, Japanese, Persian, Urdu, Turkish, Swahili, Italian, various Slavic languages, and a whole host that I have not named. And as I said, they're juxtaposed against what is called the big three. And I have to say that sometimes two of the big three are starting to feel a little less big um, as enrollments come and go these days. 
After 9-11, the US federal departments and agencies reorganized the strategic importance of less commonly taught languages such as Arabic for the purpose of national security. Arabic, Persian, Hindi, Korean, Mandarin, Chinese, Ru and Russian became part of national flagship initiatives for the purpose of national security. But we know that there are so many other reasons to study less commonly taught languages. And that is what I think we will be stressing today. And I'm glad that we have the panel here to discuss it. So we have, we have kind of centered around a few questions. I welcome our panel. Um, and we have a few questions and then we will open it up to the larger audience at the end for any questions they might have or comments that they would like to make. So we're glad you're here and, and welcome to this evening. So I guess the first question I would ask is, what can we do to get students into less commonly taught languages before high school? And that's because we all know that teaching languages, once they get to high school, yes, we've got them and then they go on sometimes to college, but really, it is essential that we get them aware of languages even before high school. So I will start with Leslie and ask her to comment on this. Oh, and Jacques, oh, then let me, oh, please, before I even go to Leslie, we, Jacques is here. We have one more panelist, Jacques Pierre. And I don't know why his picture isn't coming up, but anyway, Jacques is a lecturing fellow of Romance Studies and specifically French and Haitian Creole at Duke University. And he studied Haitian Creole and French applied linguistics at the State University of Haiti. He is coordinator of the Haiti Lab and a core affiliated faculty member of the Center of Latin and Caribbean Studies. And for the past three years, he has been coordinating Duke Engage in Miami. And we're, we're glad you're here, Jacques, because I have some good questions for you too. <laughs> so back to the original question for Leslie, what can we do to get students into less commonly taught languages before high school? Sure, thank you. Uh, so I, I think it's about that early start as well as increasing the enrollment in, in high school both because they are less commonly taught languages, right? So our, our goal is to increase enrollment at, at all levels. I think one, uh, and, and in our district, uh, I'm, as you said, I'm the coordinator in Winston-Salem, Forsyth County, and we have eight language programs in our district, um, including Japanese, Chinese, and American Sign Language, which is rather less commonly taught as well. Um, and I think uh, one key to earlier starts and to increasing enrollment is to increase familiarity with the languages, because it's not just about the reasons why, such as defense, like you mentioned, and, and all the other benefits we know about with language learning, but when it comes to the less commonly taught languages, um, to, to pardon the pun, they feel very foreign to uh, the wider community who are not involved in, in languages. I think the big three are what they are because they're more similar to English. They feel more comfortable to people. Uh, you know, the, the writing systems are the same. The alphabets are the same, that sort of thing. Whereas with uh, Japanese, Chinese, um, Urdu, Arabic, whatever it, it might be, those feel very, very different to people and therefore intimidating. And so they're a little more scared of, of that. So I think we have to do things that break down that barrier to a degree uh, and make them more inviting, more familiar, not feel so, again, quote unquote, foreign. Uh, that might, uh, that can happen through immersion programs. Immersion programs, of course, have grown in the state. We have over 200 uh, in North Carolina now, some of which are in less commonly taught languages. And that's certainly a strong way to increase enrollment at the lower levels and get kids starting with their, their language learning in kindergarten. But I think we also have to do things that, um, that, that get the languages and the cultures out there to the wider community. And that might mean after school clubs at lower levels. It might mean introductory classes uh, in, in middle school that, it, that help students start that study a little bit earlier. In North Carolina, students can earn a level one high school credit for languages they take in middle school. And so if we can add those less commonly taught languages to the middle school programs, that helps them get started a little sooner, helps them get into the upper levels in high school, especially for these languages that it might take a little longer to get to the AP level uh, and that kind of thing. Um, 
as with many elective courses, language courses are all about demand. It's economics. It's all about supply and demand. We need a supply of teachers and we need demand for the courses. And whether it's at early levels or at high school, if we don't see the demand, which is shown through registration and through parents saying we want these courses, then we don't supply it. And so what we really have to do is look at how do we increase the demand in the community for less commonly taught languages. And I think that has to start with some community outreach and, uh, and may depend upon you know, populations in different areas, but we have to find ways to increase that demand so that we can then work on the supply. Thank you. Any other comments, any other panelists want to comment on this? A related question then is how, how can we, I mean, you say demand, and that's really important. How can we get the advisors and the counselors informed of these opportunities for, that when the parents ask something, when they, when they want for something, very often advisors and counselors have not really pushed these languages or really don't know that much. And we know how important these counselors are in, in pushing students into different directions. How can we get them involved in this and so that they're providing good information to their advisees? That's a very good question. And it certainly can be a challenge sometimes because you're right. They can be very influential in, in what students um, will request. And if they say, oh, well, we don't offer that, then the student doesn't doesn't start it, right? So I think there has to be a message to counselors and that has to come from, um, from the district level uh, to counselors saying, you know, we can offer this um, if students demand it. One thing, uh, I, one uh, example can be, um, I mentioned clubs, those can be a great way to start the interest and start the demand so that students and parents are then going to the counselors, going to the principal saying, we want this. We've been doing this club. It's been very successful. My kids are really interested. We want this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if districts are uh, similar to mine, then when that demand starts, when parents start asking for something, um, that we, we start to offer it. Uh, that's how American Sign Language started in our district. It started with a club at a high school and that turned into students saying, we want this as a course, we want this as a class, and it grew from there. Um, it, ev even uh, at schools where, where it wasn't originally offered, there were enough students saying we want it that, that counselors had to offer it. Um, so yes, we do have to get a message to counselors about um, uh, the opportunities available and why we need varied opportunities, not just everybody taking Spanish. Great. Thank you very much. Well, related to that, I mean, we're, we're talking about the pre high school or even the high school level. What is the state of community based language learning in North Carolina? And I'm going to address this question to Marta, who has had some experience as she she has the Slovak, the Czech and Slovak school. Um, Marta, tell us a little bit about your experience in community based language learning. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so I was going to jump in and this is perfect um, question, perfect segue. Um, so again, if when when <clears throat> languages are less commonly taught, languages are not offered necessarily uh, in elementary schools, that they will be offered and are offered in community based heritage language schools. <clears throat> and uh, the major challenge I think that we are facing in North Carolina and across the US is that we don't really know about these schools. Uh, we might know about our own one language community-based school, but we don't know there are other ones. And what is surprising, we don't even think there maybe there are other ones. We don't even look for them. So uh, it, it is really, <clears throat> that's the major challenge for, uh, for these schools to connect with public schools and find, in, find a way of collaboration in which um, we can help each other out. Um, so as Leslie was talking about <clears throat> the fact that parents can require something and ask for something, um, I wanted to add that uh, some of these communities are coming from very different cultural background and they don't necessarily know that they can go to a public school and ask for something and that it's gonna happen. 
And that, so that's not always uh, in, in their sort of cultural um, experience. So again, as we talked about the counselors, I think it is very helpful if those counselors can inform the parents and say, these would be options if you show interest. So that is, I think, very key in, on any level, actually, including high school. <clears throat> high schools. But going back to the community-based schools, um, so there are many community-based language schools in North Carolina. Um, we know about maybe 30 or 35 at this point, uh, but there is no um, association or, or organization that would be uh, like an umbrella for these schools. Uh, so that's that's one of these challenges. Uh, but all these schools, most these schools meet on Saturdays and they provide language instruction uh, for students from sometimes since birth, but more likely uh, since the preschool level through um, middle school. And uh, many of these schools would like to offer high school instructions, but they are um, often faced with the fact that their students are leaving them uh, to go study the more commonly taught languages because they often can get credit for it or they, they somehow have to figure out what will help them in uh, their, their college applications. So um, that, that's sort of what ha what's happening and there's a wide variety. It's Bulgarian, Brazilian, Portuguese, Chinese, Czech and Slovak, Greek, Hungarian, Polish, Farsi, um, Tamil, uh, Turkish, Ukrainian, lots of schools. Um, and uh, I'll, I would also mention last, one last thing that they, they are most typically based either in Charlotte, um, larger sort of city, Durham or, or Raleigh. So again, uh, we would find these options in, in these larger uh, cities in North Carolina. And I'll, I'm happy to say more later when uh, we get to another question. What would it take? I, I, I just have a follow up on that. What would it take? What what would be the advantage of having an umbrella organization for all of these schools? What 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 advantages would these schools see if there were an umbrella organization that could unite them? What what would you what advantages would you gain by that? Um, there I would I would believe there would be, be many. Um, so one one of them would be that uh, these schools would know about each other and they could share. Uh, their experience. They, sh they could share experience about rental, uh, renting spaces, about uh, teacher training, about collaboration with public schools, about events, about fundraising, about any of it really. Um, and the second major sort of benefit would be that, that these schools could um, <clears throat> come together and, uh, <clears throat> ex and, and present themselves to perhaps, let's say, the uh, Department of Public Instructions. Uh, they could maybe have a website, they could maybe have a um, some way of presenting themselves so that it is usable um, and accessible to, to anyone in the state. Um, so I think that would be great and uh, we're not quite there. There is a Facebook group for uh, these uh, schools, so people who work in these schools. Mm -hmm. so that's where we are so far. Right. Leslie, you had a point to make about this? Uh, sure. So uh, I think uh, that was a great point, Marta, about the, the potential for collaboration between the community schools and the public schools, and that I, th I think there's a lot of untapped potential there for how those community schools can help uh, with, with starting or building programs in the public schools. And, and one thing for those high school students that, that the community schools are losing, there's a process in North Carolina where students can earn high school credit for courses that they don't actually take and that aren't actually offered uh, through um, the credit for demonstrated mastery process. So a student can, if they have experience in a language, whatever language it might be from a community school, they can apply for this process to get credit on their transcript uh, for courses. So that doesn't exactly help us on the enrollment side, but it does certainly help give students an incentive to stay with that community school and continue to learn their heritage language or you know, whether it's a native heritage, whatever it might be. But that's a great way for, for them to take advantage of what they're learning in the community school and still get credit on their transcript for it. Excellent. That's well, great... you, you mentioned the word enrollment. Oh, did, did someone Just... follow up? Uh, very quickly, I think that's a very, very good point. And again, 
sometimes uh, the parents don't know about this. <clears throat> so I think that is what we're facing here. Um, people don't have the idea that they can get credit for speaking Bulgarian and knowing Bulgarian. And, and of course, there is a process that has to, they have to, to complete. That's another that part of it. But the, the fact that they don't know, uh, you know, that we, we were going back to sort of the information um, um, point here. If, uh, if parents are more informed, uh, they might be finding their ways. Um, so that would be helpful. And yeah, thank you. So it's not just the advisors, it's also the parents that need to be informed about, about what, is, what is possible and what the opportunities are. Well, moving towards, towards high school and then also university level, introductory courses in languages are usually enrolled well enough. We get, we get a lot of interest in the 101 level, but there's a problem in getting students to continue to the more advanced levels, especially at the university. How can we increase the number of students to continue beyond the introductory and intermediate levels of a language? And I'll direct this to Mike Turner. And I'll follow up on what uh, Martha just said about the parents and advisors need to know, as well as students themselves. And so when students go to university, they kind of take, I'd say, a stronger command of their own education. And one of the issues I think we have in uh, less commonly taught languages is that students don't always realize how far they can go with them. Um, and so sometimes they look at the uh, they look at the catalog and they'll see there's you know three courses of Arabic or Chinese or what other. Uh, what, what a, whatever other um, less commonly taught language, but the, the reality is they can actually go much farther. And I think it's upon, it's it's kind of our our duty as teachers to say, I'm going to support you past whatever level is on the uh, catalog. If you finish the courses we offer formally, then we can do independent studies. I can get you in touch with other um, instructors on other campuses who can continue to work with you past that level. Uh, and I think from doing that from the beginning gives students the sense of I can really continue this. This is something that's going to be a long term project. Um, in term in terms of creating that other that sense of a long term project, I also think it's important that we look at high schools as a starting point because that way when students come in, they're not starting at the beginning level, they're starting at the intermediate level, and they're already kind of going towards the advanced level. So that that in and of itself can help increase enrollment. And probably the easiest answer here would be to say we should lobby our universities and our schools to have a higher ling language requirement. <laughs> but uh, I think it's I think since that might not always be possible, it really is about advertising, about creating this sense of opportunity, and about saying to students, as soon as you kind of make it to a certain level, once you've gotten past the intermediate level, there are a lot of opportunities that opened up in terms of being able to study abroad and really communicate um, in languages like Arabic and some of the other so-called critical languages you mentioned, Ruth. Um, there are a lot of opportunities that are funded, especially from the government. So that's something I try to talk about to my students as well and say, if you continue past the beginning level, you'll start to get into this, this world of free money and really free opportunities to travel and to continue your language. And that, I think, has motivated a lot of my students to continue with it past the intermediate level. Anyone else want to comment on that? Marta? I will comment very briefly, and and again, I think this is in the community-based schools can be very helpful. And I I, I personally want to force uh, foster um, relationships with universities because many of the university language programs are uh, facing problems with that with low enrollments, and uh, we I don't feel like there is enough communication. Uh, with those respective communities. So there is a Czech language program at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, but I wonder how many people of the, from the Czech community know that their state university offers this language course that would allow their child not only excel in the language they already know, but also be able to study in that home country and maybe do research or, or focus on history of that, right? So there, there would be a flow of more than intermediate skilled uh, speakers of that language if the, if the communication is a little stronger. So that's the future. Yeah, and I would say that, Mike, as you mentioned, study abroad, that's, that, that's the, I, I guess, the, the carrot. And if we can get students to really know that it makes a difference. It's, it's wonderful if you're just learning and just starting out and going abroad. That we all know that we have that experience, but it is so much better if you have two years under, under your belt and then go abroad and you have so much more of the culture once you have the language. And it, it, it just, 
that's that's what you have to get the students to, that they're just climbing the ladder and if they can see over the top and we got to get them to that point where they can see over the top of the ladder into what the world will offer them if they get more more study but, but maybe it's a kind of it's harder that. and harder i'm sorry um, just maybe as a counterpoint if students study abroad early sometimes that kind of sparks this desire to go forward with the language and get to a high level and a lot of times i think these these short-term study abroad programs that are over spring break, I've seen these at UNCW, really inspire students to say, I want to go back there and I want to really engage it deeply. And that can inspire them to, you know, again, enroll in intermediate or advanced courses and continue. So I think it goes both ways, right? I mean, study abroad is never sure. no, it's never true. a negative it's thing. True. Perhaps study abroad, no matter when, is, is valuable. Yeah. I think we'll all agree on that. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, as uh, Jacques, you are a teacher of Haitian Creole, and I would like you to talk a little bit about, interestingly, the situation, the, the linguistic situation in Haiti, because it's a different culture and how they study language, and also the importance of exposing our own high school students to Haitian Creole when it comes to talk or study about Haiti itself. And, and uh, so what has your experience been and, and, and how would you answer those questions? You have to unmute yourself, Chuck. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Now we can hear you. Thank you for the question. Uh, based on the Haitian constitution, the last one, so there are two official languages in Haiti, French and Haitian Creole. But however, uh, for all Haitians growing up in Haiti, we know 100% of Haitians speak Creole. And French is only spoken by a very slim minority of people. The social uh, economic relationship between these two languages is very complex because French is still perceived by many Haitians as the prestigious language. Uh, it also equates to knowledge and then all of the good things. When Creole uh, is the opposite. I'm talking about, you know, the perception. But now there's been, you know, going effort, you know, in promoting Creole, you know, everywhere uh, in international communities. And then even, you know, in Haiti itself, you know, because now people are free to speak Creole wherever they go. But there's still a long way to go because the Haitian authorities are still you know, clanging, you know, to French because they feel like, you know, French is not the only route to go. But when it comes, you know, to teaching Haitian Creole here, I always, you know, tell people, how can you study a country or a community without, you know, knowing the language spoken, you know, by the majority of population. And here, you know, at Duke, there are a lot of students who are very interested in studying Haiti, Haitian literature, Haitian history, and I always, you know, make it clear to them the first uh, point, the first, st the starting point is to learn the language, because if you go on the ground, how are you going to conduct a research? How are you going, you know, to speak, you know, uh, to people if you don't know the language? You know, how can, you know, this research, you know, would be, you know, valuable? Uh, in terms of, you know, enrollment, you know, as it says, you know, clearly it's a less community taught languages, you know, the ups and downs, but so far it's pretty strong because there are a lot of people who are very interested, you know, in Haiti, especially, you know, the Haitian revolution. And the only way you can get a very uh, strong understanding of Haitian revolution is starting, you know, by learning uh, the language. I know there are a lot of kids, you know, uh, high school who know a little bit of Haiti, but they still need, you know, the language. The way we can introduce, you know, Haiti, especially to them, is by uh, having them, you know, watching like a movie about Haiti, like an art movie, or about, you know, something related to uh, history, because most of the time uh, people know about the negative parts, you know, of Haiti to counter, you know, the bad narratives, you know, about Haiti. So we can expose, you know, the language, the beautiful language, Creole, to uh, Haitian kids, but at the same time, the culture and then history, you know, and other things. 
and then at Duke, there are like four, six levels now. It starts from, you know, elementary to advanced, you know, level. And at the end of the last session, so everyone, but usually there are not more, a lot of people, maybe four or five students. So we find a way, you know, to take them all, you know, to Haiti. And then they can stay there at least for a month. They can, you know, put, you know, what they learn into practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, continuing just with this whole idea of Haitian Creole, uh, how do students who, who have taken Haitian Creole have any background in French or do they come to Haitian Creole without, without any background in, in the French language at all? Some do. Yeah. Yeah. Some like French or Spanish and then English, but you know, it, it, it helps, you know, but at the end of the day, people, you know, have no background, you know, will uh, have a better proficiency in the language. Let's see. Okay, thank you. Marta, uh, do students at the Czech and Slovak schools have any interest or experience with other Slavic languages? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I, I would say not necessarily because the, the schools are mostly for children. So the community-based schools mostly serve the population of children and um, maybe high schoolers. Uh, so those would not necessarily have um, any interest or, or experience, but by knowing the Czech language, they definitely have an advantage if they decide to, let's say, go study Russian or another Slavic language. So by studying this language, they will have much easier time studying any other Slavic language. And, and vice versa, really, um, when um, one studies in a Slavic department at the university, often these students are required to take um, another Slavic language besides Russian. Russian is like the big language, and then you have to take a little small language. So, uh, so again, our here our goal would be to try to promote the Czech as to be to be the coolest small language there is, uh, and and then have the students sort of maybe think about um, going into again studying area studies, Central Europe, and then picking up this language. Because it is not just linguists who study language, uh, languages, right? And maybe that is, again, we're going back to the information. When do we, what do we tell the students and children? Why should they care about languages? Because they know very well that wherever they go in the world, they can speak English and they'll be just fine. But they will perhaps not get enough of that cultural experience if they don't speak the language. And I don't know if they get that message. But, but again, um, the, the, the students may not study languages. They might be interested in, in history or they might be interested in politics. But they might, if they decide they are interested in Central European politics, they may want to study Czech language. And they should know that because I think sometimes they only realize that, that when they are like, uh, you know, juniors in college and they're they're basically out, uh, and that's too late. So, <clears throat> okay, really uh, Mike, you have a lot of experience in Arabic with dialects, <laughs> and uh, so learning sometimes learning a less commonly taught language gets you in the door, but then it there are all of these other doors, B and C yeah. and D, and where do the students go with that? What, well, I really, what, I thought, what first of all, I thought it's interesting that uh, Marta said Russian's a big language, right? Because if we zoom out, zoom out even more, I mean, Russian's still a less commonly taught language, right? Yeah. And I do think it's fair, I mean, to maybe even talk about different types of, or different levels of less commonly taught languages, right? Are there even less commonly taught languages? Um, and I think Arabic would be in the, the larger group. I mean, it's a, it's a larger, less commonly taught language. I mean, there's probably, there's over a hundred programs in the United States and universities alone. So Arabic itself tends to be a gateway language where you can take Arabic, you can learn the script, um, learn some basic vocabulary. And from there, you can either kind of dive, dive in deeper and ultimately to be a good Arabic speaker, you, you do need to learn a dialect of some sort, right? Uh, another pathway though, is to take Arabic and then get into Islamic languages, as you might call them like Persian, um, Turkish, Swahili, um, and even other, I mean, other, other, other language groups that take a lot of vocabulary from Arabic often use the same script, but aren't the same language, right? Um, and so I think that, you know, there is this relationship uh, and you don't have to be a linguist to take, to notice that relationship and kind of use that as a pathway. Um, if your professional goal is to work in the Middle East or to work um, in a particular country in, in Europe, et cetera, right? 
And so, yeah, I, I think the dialect issue in Arabic tends, tends to come up a lot in our field because the Arab world itself has more than 20 countries. And so if you want to specialize, then you take an Arabic class that's going to be focused on Egyptian Arabic or on Syrian Arabic or on Moroccan Arabic, as is the case in our program. Um, so I do try to teach a very broad conception of Arabic so that that will be open to different students. They can kind of take it their own direction from there. Okay. Any other comments about, about the difference in, within languages uh, that are related? Okay. Uh, I um, one of the questions that 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 came up, and I think that we all have to face, probably more in the high school area, although it also is to a certain extent in in the first year one hundred ones. I think in in university, how do we get teachers and students to understand that languages are serious subjects, not just to be dismissed as fun electives? Yes, they're fun. We all know we love languages. Everything is, but but. They have to be studied seriously if they're really going to be learned. There have to be quality objectives and all of this. So, as a, so, so how can we get teachers, students, just people in general at the university to understand that languages are more than just fun, that they are serious and that we have goals in teaching them and that they need to be studied and time needs to be spent on them. And it shouldn't always be relegated to the last class uh, because math or science is more important. Coming from a STEM university, <laughs> I understand how students think and it's very often difficult to get them to put the language in the first place. Um, I'll start with Leslie here on and ask her this question. Sure, and that's the, the question of the ages, right? Uh, as, as a former Spanish teacher, that, that's always the, the challenge. But one thing that, that we've really worked on, uh, certainly in recent years uh, as a profession, I think is trying to, to get them the message across, whether it's to counselors, students, parents, all those groups we've mentioned, that it's not just about taking language, for language sake, it's about language as a vehicle to other things. So like what Marta was saying about students who want to work in some type of, you know, Middle Eastern policy or politics or something like that, that, that the language is a vehicle to help you with that. So it's not just because I'm going to take Czech because I think I want to be a Czech teacher. Like, that's going to be a little less on the likely side, right? But it's more about I have an interest in this part of the world and there's something I'm going to do with my profession that's going to take me there and I need language. Or I want to go into the medical field and I know that it will help a great deal um, in, in my practice if I can speak one or more languages of the people I'm going to work with. Uh, and that that would be beneficial. So that it's it's less about language for language sake, because as language people, of course, we all think that's wonderful and it, and it is, but but there has to be um, a greater goal there for, for um, a, a larger population, I think. Um, we also work to really show how our language courses relate to other content and help students in other content areas. Because we know that if students take languages for, uh, for several years, for, for, for the four or more years, that they do better in other subject areas. We know that it helps them understand their native language better if they take another language. Uh, most of my teachers will say that, you know, their, their students don't know English grammar and they learn it in their language class, right? And that was certainly true for me as a high school student. I, I learned all my grammar in Spanish. Uh, so we really try to talk about how our courses connect to and benefit other courses as opposed to just, hey, language is great, you should take it. Uh, but but really showing um, the the wide range of benefits and how it will add to um, whatever a, a student wants to do after high school uh, and not just for the sake of language itself, if that makes sense. Any other comments on this? Marta? Uh, oh, Jacques. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, one thing I was going to say is, if we uh, list uh, all the languages like Haitian, Creole, and culture, French, you know, and culture. So I think, you know, that uh, 
uh, attract you know more people because most of the time students when they see like French they always think it's just language there's nothing related to culture nothing to history nothing but the way I uh, do this you know here at Duke with the Haitian Creole and culture at the same time you know I list a lot of things like for example we're gonna cover this you know in Haitian culture we gotta cover this part you know in Haitian history for example 1804 to 1860 and then we're gonna cover this you know in like culinary stuff you know in Haiti and then list a lot of things you know that are related you know to Haitian culture and Haitian history to make it like more attractive you know to people it's not just you know learning Haitian Creole, you know, for the sake of learning Haitian Creole, because I think it's one of the things that, you know, a lot of students uh, uh, don't feel comfortable about. It's just, you know, learning the language just for the language. But if there are a lot of elements, like cultural elements, historical elements, they'll be more interested, you know, in taking, you know, the class. Mm -hmm. Very, very good point. Marta, did you want to add something? I think I will very briefly. So we, as we were talking about how to make language learning more attractive, um, we we do, of course, um, emphasize all that Leslie said. I think that was that was um, the, that she offered many, many reasons for why to study language. Uh, we can also be very straightforward and, and uh, you know, show the dollar sign and explain that you know, today businesses are always looking for people who are bilingual and you will always have a better chance of getting whatever job you are trying to get if you are bilingual. Also, now with COVID even, uh, we are, it's much easier to work across boundaries, across, across countries. Um, you know, uh, jobs are being maybe more international in some ways. Um, so in that case, also, there will always be need for some sort of bilingualism. So, so that, uh, you know, rather than saying that it's going to be nice for you to know a language, uh, you know, put it into a very clear perspective, like this is going to really uh, get you the kind of job and, and income you want when you when you graduate uh, because that's what that's what's often on like high school kids and, and college teach, uh, college college um, college students minds really that's what they want to get out of it um, and one last comment um, some countries out in the world uh, do start with um, with uh, language learning and teaching at in fourth or fifth grade again um, so we do start sort of mandatory kind of mandatory in high school it's not really even mandatory at there at all uh, but so where I come from it is mandatory to start in fourth or fifth grade I forgot um, so so there you know we can try to convince the parents but we can also try to convince the system um, if there is a way to do that um, and that way the, the question wouldn't be should I take a language but the question be would be which language do I take and maybe that would be a, a good step forward Thank that you. would be wonderful, Marta. If we can, <laughs> I, I, I've been around a long time, and believe me, the, the, the trying to convince people that languages should be started in elementary schools and that we should have, and we always have these model schools and they're always brought out, you know, they have the immersion schools that are doing Chinese now and whatever else, and it's lovely, but they're always just the one school or the other school, it isn't the norm. And how we get that to be the norm, that it, this is a battle that has been going on, on Unfortunately, I think America is really behind behind on language learning. I mean, as, as much as we try, we're all invested in this, but it's 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 been a hard battle, and it hasn't gotten. I haven't seen it. There 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 are pockets, and it's wonderful, but on the whole, it's still an uphill battle here in America to convince people that languages are important. That that that's, I shouldn't be so negative. I'm sorry. <laughs> Certainly, all. Can I, if I can, Leslie, to, to something Marta just said. Um, so sure. a couple of things there, and I hope there's not too much background noise where where I am. Um, the one thing on the the importance of the languages that that you were initially asking about. Another thing we've really worked on in our courses is uh, really making them communicative in nature, meaningful in nature. Uh, I, I think many of our uh, administrators and parents went through high school courses where they sat there and conjugated verbs and memorized dialogues. And, and that was, you know, kind of kind of the par for the course in their in their language courses. And we worked very hard in all of our language courses, whether less commonly taught or more commonly taught, to really ensure that um, students are using critical thinking skills in the language class. 
that they are applying the skills they're learning for meaningful purposes, and that, that teachers are helping administrators, parents, the community see that that is happening, that, that, teach, that, that students are using language for meaningful purposes, and they're not just having, you know, Taco Tuesday and Flag Friday, but, uh, but they really are diving into language and culture uh, and, and into, um, into these issues. But, but to speak to, um, to immersion and to starting early and requiring language early, you know, I mentioned immersion programs earlier as a way to get students into language early. And you're right, they're not the norm. They have grown quite a bit um, in the last several years. Uh, and, and again, back to those community-based schools and those community-based language groups, that's a great way to partner for public schools to partner with the community is to build immersion programs in languages that are in the community. That's what happened uh, with the Cherokee language uh, right here in North Carolina. They really wanted to, um, to save their heritage language. So the community worked with the school system and they started a Cherokee immersion program that is thriving. It's an amazing example of a beautiful partnership uh, with a certainly a less commonly taught language for sure. And so if there is a population of a particular language in an area, if they can work with the school system to help support an immersion program that can support those heritage learners, as well as teach the language to native English speakers, then that's a great way to, um, to build enrollment, build programs, get them started early, and they can have high levels of proficiency by the time they even reach middle school, much less you know, what they can do in high school and moving on into college. Great. Mike, did you have something yeah, to say? Yeah, before we leave the topic of making languages serious, I thought I'd go back to what Jock had said about uh, teaching language and culture simultaneously in the same course. And I sense personally a bit of tension in, in the way some of us as language teachers teach, and I feel it myself, in that I kind of want to just have a fully immersive, all the language all the time sort of class, right? But also understand that students who come to the class really want to express themselves on a higher level and they want to talk about geopolitical issues and they want to talk about tough cultural questions, right? And I think in doing that, you know, I've, I've tried to start to delineate, you know, this is the time where we're going to use, we're going to really be immersive and just directly say, now we're going to speak in English and we're going to talk about such and such cultural issue. And I think um, as we've I think giving students that outlet to say, okay, I don't have to sit here and be like, hey, how are you? Especially in introduction class where they really are learning the basics or learning, you know, the name, how to say I'm from such and such city or um, I like to drink coffee. And that's great, right? But they also don't want to feel like they're being infantilized and they can't talk about these really salient cultural, I mean, social cultural questions, right? And so I think making that space for it is really important for keeping the momentum and then letting them see that if they continue along with the language itself, at some point, those two objectives are going to meet and giving them that goal, giving them a place they can get to, I think is really important. And so I really like that comment you made, Chuck. Very interesting point. Very interesting point. I, I think we all, even, even in commonly taught languages, we get to that point where you know that there's a frustration level. And, and we are, at, certainly at the university, we're teaching students that have ideas and want to say things. And so you very often have to get to that point and say, okay, five minutes, we're going to talk in English and we'll get to the, but this it's a very important point. Well, you all have likely created most of, or some of your digital materials. Um, I'll, I'll start with Jacques here because I would think that there aren't a lot of Haitian Creole materials out there that you can use that you have to create your own. Could you tell, talk a little bit about the process of what you do for creating material and, and successful, what is successful in, in digital material and so forth that you create for the class? Uh, so let's say, I believe, you know, there are always, you know, there are always a lot of materials, you know, around. It depends, you know, on how we see things. For example, there are a lot of uh, newspaper uh, website online, for example, Aibo Post, Alter Press, and Le Nouvelis. There are a lot of things, you know, um, based in Haiti. And I got, you know, all the text. And then I made, you know, lesson plans, you know, based on the text. The good thing is that, you know, those materials are like, are related to the current events, you know, going on, you know, in Haiti. In a way, you know, it helps me because 
students can feel like, okay, we're talking about things that are happening, you know, to Haiti right now. It's not things, you know, based like 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And when I look at, you know, several texts, the first thing I did, you know, I made the lesson plan based on like vocabulary, new words, new expressions, and then grammar, and then cultural parts, and then create, you know, listening, you know, activities too. Sometimes I invited, you know, people uh, from Haiti, but via Zoom to talk, you know, to students, and then they can uh, ask them, you know, questions too. Just, you know, like to get them, you know, engage with people, you know, on the ground, because after maybe two or two months, they are used, you know, to my Creole accent, like, you know, when speaking Creole, I also would like them to uh, be able to listen to other speakers, you know, on the ground, and then using, you know, different words, you know, a uh, lot of things that we don't discuss, you know, in class, and they can, you know, ask, you know, those people, you know, questions, and then see how they are doing, you know, in the language. So I got, you know, materials from, you know, like, uh, broadcast show, TV shows, uh, things online, and then novels, uh, poems, kind of like everything, and then put all of them, you know, together, and then to create, you know, uh, so my classes. And then every semester, so I update, you know, the materials because there are new things going on on the ground, and I would like, you know, every student, you know, who takes, you know, queer class as a strong idea of what's going on on the ground. Thank you. Uh, any any other comments about development of successful digital materials and class realia and so forth that you've done, used in less commonly taught areas where there may not be as much as there are for the big three, so to speak? Mike, are you shaking your head yes? Yeah, I can, I can comment a bit. Um, what I've done with digital materials I guess going back to this idea of Arabic being uh, one of the larger, less commonly taught languages, there are materials that are fairly standard. And we do have you know, textbook packages you can buy that have uh, digital learning platforms, and that's nice. What we don't have is really good entrance to some of the dialects, and the one I worked on most is Moroccan Arabic, um, which is increasingly the Arabic dialect that students are most likely to be able to use if they go abroad, um, because Egyptian and Syrian were the traditional dialects people learn. Those countries have not been so accessible for uh, students in the, in the past decade, really. Um, so a lot of students study abroad in Morocco and then they find out, well, I wanna be able to talk to people and I've never been trained in the actual basics of getting around, saying hello, asking for coffee, et cetera. Uh, so I've been making those materials to go alongside the existing curricula that most Arabic programs use. And, uh, what I've learned in the process, one of the biggest things, to, one of the most important things I think is having a single platform <laughs> being, because for a while I was saying, I was telling my students here, you have to use this, this set of materials for standard Arabic and then go to this other website from rock and Arabic. And something I've done this past year is actually combine them all into a single package. And it's worked a lot better because students would get confused. And it's, I didn't know which site to find it on. Um, so that's, that's been one of my takeaways is <laughs> trying to make, keep it simple. Um, quality of recording, I think is important. Um, it's something we kind of take for granted, but even just getting a quiet room and a condenser mic for recording some of these things. Um, what I did with my materials is I actually met up with Moroccan friends of mine and we sat down, I had the vocab list, kind of prepped everything in advance and they just went through, recorded them and then I spliced them later on. And I made it so you just, if you wanna hear a word, you click on the word and then you can get the pronunciation. So. It's been an ongoing, an ongoing process and finding actors in particular is really hard. If you ever want to make a more complex video than just, hey, how are you doing? Um, to get people who can really memorize lines and act it out and make it sound fluid, but also accessible is really a challenge. And I think um, this is something probably we, we could share with each other and, and learn a lot from each other's experiences doing. Because <laughs> for me, it was, it was always a learning experience, even just trying to record a single video. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, one, one last question, I think, and then we'll open it up to, to, the, uh, to the participants here. But uh, there was a question that came up earlier, and this takes us back to the community-based learning. Marta, and maybe you will, you will be the person to answer this one. There was a question about how 
teaching is regulated at community-based schools? How, how do you control for quality? How do you make sure that students are learning what they should at that level? How, how, what, that it's not just, that it's not just, uh-huh, that, that you're putting a student, uh, one of your students there for an hour, so it's a pastime and others, that, that they're really learning something, I guess. That's the question. <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you. Very good question, of course. So I would also answer with a question, right? So we want to also ask uh, who uh, who sets up these schools, uh, who is one in charge, and who is the one who funds these schools, right? It's not like a state, um, like uh, education, K through 12, that is funded through the state. So state obviously is going to control what's happening in those schools. So that's not the case for community-based schools. Each of the schools is typically its own small nonprofit. And to be honest, they can do whatever they want, okay? But they really, they are, they, they are set up or they are founded for the purpose to help the community, to respond to a need in that community. And that could differ very much. So some communities want to make sure their children are proficient 100%, they can read and write and they can go to college in Turkey. Okay, so they really want to make sure they got that language down. Others communities might be a lot more sort of flexible and just laid back. They just want to make sure the child can understand when grandma calls and can say a few words and it will be a cute interaction, right? So, so I think that the beauty in the community-based schools is that it they come out of the, the community itself or are founded by the community members, usually parents with some kind of um, um, non-fear factor, parents who believe everything is possible, so they just go ahead and do it. Um, but uh, those, they, those are responding to the needs in that community. Um, and then again, it's the community who will ask, say this, we need this, we need that, but there is no sort of overarching necessarily control um, as much as I say, and I've answered something in the chat. Sometimes some schools are receiving funding from the home country. And there could be some sort of oversight from, from that um, sort of area. So if, uh, let's say, German schools, that's not a less community thought language. Sorry, no. Uh, others, if some other language receives the funding, um, they may have to tell to the other government what they're doing, but not necessarily anywhere in here. But, but a good practice is that the school is very much open about what their goals are. Um, they allow people to come in and see what's happening. Uh, they have a curriculum, they show the materials. So they communicate with the parents about what is happening, what are their, what are their sort of um, outcomes that they wish for. And then the parent will decide, is that working for me or it, it does it not work for me? And if it doesn't, they can go to some online classes, which we have plenty of them over since the last year or two. So it did that answer the question? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Leslie, I agree with you. More and more German is less commonly taught. You're absolutely that's what I start where I started with this. Um I, I just yeah, just wanted to say a little bit. Uh, before we open it up, um, I had mentioned the the uh, language exchange, um, and I don't know how many many people in the community who are not part of the university system know about the language exchange. But we started this through the system through the UNC system, so that students from a particular university who might not be able who might not have a certain language at their university could take that language if she or he wanted to uh, at another university where it was offered. And that that was really the, the, the idea behind the exchange 10 years ago. Also, because a lot of places were losing languages and we didn't want the students in North Carolina to lose the opportunity to be able to take the languages they want. Well, we now are up to 19 languages that are offered on the exchange in, in the university system. So, Theoretically, any student who is enrolled in one of the 16 universities or even the, the high school um, of science and, and uh, tech and science uh, could, can take any of those languages if she or he can fit it into the program um, that they're taking. And, and the last two years have been, we know they've been hard on everybody, but for language teaching and for the exchange, it's been really good because a lot of these classes have just gone on Zoom. And so it's been easier to connect within the 17, univer uh, 17 uh, university sy uh, system schools. So it's uh, it's been an interesting experience. Uh, I've been working on it for since 2011. 
uh, Mike has joined the, the team and is, is part of the executive committee now. And, and we find our problems uh, trying to get students into these languages because word of mouth is right now the only way we have. We haven't, we haven't conquered the advertising to let students know that this is out there. So that's one of the things we're really working on now and, and turning to social media. We hope to turn to social media and really get good at social media and get people in to realizing they can take Korean or they can take Swahili or they can take Cherokee, um, even if it's not offered at their own university. So that's, that's kind of what we've been doing at the university level. And I did want to raise this and, and bring this to people's attention. Mike, did I leave anything out? You're, you're, the, you're the other expert here on this. No, you pretty, that was a good, a good summary, but I, I'd just say personally, I've, I've been teaching for, I think this is my fourth year on the language exchange and I've had students from nine different system universities so far. And so wait, still waiting to collect them all, but uh, it's been a pretty good, it's been over half, half the system schools have, had, have sent students to me and it, it contributes in a lot of ways to meeting our goals and teaching less commonly taught languages because it helps students who otherwise couldn't take advanced courses take them. It helps students who couldn't even start at the beginning level take it. And so it's been a really um, successful program, really helpful for us. All right. Well, uh, I think I'm going to let Kevin take take the questions. If, if you've got questions on the que and the question and answer in the Q and A, we have some chat questions, but I think we've been answering them along the way. I don't know. Thank you. We've had a couple come in on the chat and we would welcome folks to submit their questions either using the chat or using the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, if you're on a laptop, that'll be at the bottom of your screen. If you're on a tablet, that'll be at the top of your screen as you look at us. As you submit those questions, we did get a very nice one from Kim Freeman earlier. And I wonder if I could read this out to you. It's about how teachers can have a chance to learn these languages. Um, not only as they serve populations that might be speaking a less commonly taught language, but as they seek to continue in lifelong learning, what kind of opportunities do we have for teachers to engage with less commonly taught languages in North Carolina? Well, through the language exchange, that has been the case. We, when, we, when we first started, we had a teacher from, was it Winston, from, from Winston-Salem State, I think, take, take, take Hindi from one of our, from, NC State and so forth because they wanted to get into this or so teachers have been in it. Um, there are opportunities through the exchange just by signing up. I suppose if you have in the university system, you have ways of taking a class for free if you're a faculty member. So these, these are things you can do and I, they're, they're open to anybody who wants to take them, at least in the exchange. That's for that, the exchange. I don't know how else, uh, perhaps at other universities it work. Does anyone else wanna think about, not just for university teachers, but also to open this up at the K-12 level, how can we encourage learning for our educators? When this is a very specific example, and it would be very dependent upon where you are and what your district will do. But when I first started teaching years ago now um, in Chapel Hill, they actually offered some courses uh, after school for teachers who wanted to, to start to learn languages of their students. And so I was able to take uh, Japanese for uh, for a little, you know twice a week or something like that. And you know I certainly didn't reach great levels of proficiency, but I did learn to to greet students that I had who who spoke Japanese and and could could talk with them just a little bit. And I could I learned how to tell them to sit down, please, <laughs> and things like that that were useful to me in the classroom. Um, so I mean, but that was up to that district to provide that. Uh, for for their teachers. I do know that here in Winston-Salem, sometimes the community college actually will offer courses for K-12 teachers, but they're typically in Spanish because that's the, the larger population of students we have or families we have that those teachers are gonna wanna communicate with. But it certainly could be possible that that could happen in other languages. I would just jump in and say that, uh, again, if we are looking for the languages that are being used in the community, most likely there will be a community-based heritage language schools, uh, school. So, so it just takes a few minutes to Google it up and then reach out to them. And many of the schools do provide uh, classes for adults. Uh, so my school does provide uh, language classes for adults and they're online, so it's very convenient. Um, and, and that's the, how the teachers can definitely um, learn some languages. The question is, do they 
Do they know they can do that? Do they have the time? Do they have the incentives to do so? Uh, I guess most, because teachers, you know, they are wonderful creatures and they don't have a lot of time uh, in between students and grading and any other life. So um, it would be great if they did it all for us, but we also have to be um, bringing those opportunities to them rather than expecting that they're just gonna do this day night. Yes. Absolutely. Think I'm sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Well, I was going to I was going to echo Marta's thanks for our teachers and all that they've been doing, especially at this time. Um, but it is hard to add anything else to their plates. Professor Turner. Oh uh, yeah, I, just, I mean, I just kind of follow up on that and say I I I think the in, the incentivization is something that's really important to talk about, and that's we we do have time constraints, right? And I I think some of us, probably all of us, try to we want to learn languages, right? It's fun, right? <laughs> and it's also serious, fun and serious. But <laughs> the I, I for personally, I would take every language you offer, but but it's a matter of time, and it's also a matter of what's what's my priority and what's going to be accepted as as a reasonable use of my time on the job too, right? And I think it's I think it's true that taking a language as a teacher makes you a better teacher. It puts you in the shoes of your students. You know what they're going through. It really makes you kind of psychologically analyze what your class is like for the students who are in it because you're doing the same thing. And I think it's something that makes us better teachers and really valuable for all of us. And for that very reason, we should kind of all try to collectively foster a culture that says it's good for you to take a language as a teacher. That's part of your job. It's not just something you're doing for fun. And um, I think if I had that really, if I had that sense, I'm not saying I don't. I mean, I, I think that's there. If that was really explicitly stated, I'd be much more um, eager to jump into a class and really officially enroll rather than just kind of looking through books on my free time, right? Yeah, that's very fair. I wonder if I can pose a different question to Dr. Baldwin about the experience um, out in Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools. My understanding is that y'all have a program to support higher levels of less commonly taught languages at a central site. Um, and so that you're able to get students into those upper levels even when it's not in their home district school. You've talked a little bit about launching new languages like Cherokee and ASL. Would you talk about um, the program for those higher levels and how much you think that's replicable across the state at the K-12 level or at the high school level and what advice you would give? Sure, uh, so uh, it's it kind of makes me think a little bit about how the language exchange works at the, the higher ed level. So in Winston-Salem, we have a, one of our high schools is called Career Center. And it is one of our high schools, but it is not a traditional high school in, in the sense of what you're thinking about with a high school. So. So all of our students are, are assigned to a particular, you know, or go to a particular high school, that's their home, their residential school. But there are uh, particular courses that they might want to take that if we offer them at each high school, we're not gonna have enough students to enroll, again, supply and demand, um, you know, to be able to offer that course. But if we offer them at a central location where students can come from multiple high schools together to that central location, then we can offer the course. And this is true for um, our Japanese and Chinese courses uh, for language. Um, it, it allows us to, to, to build those programs and to, to pull that enrollment from all the schools, which has, which has allowed us to have levels one through AP in Chinese and in Japanese in the district. And otherwise those courses aren't, aren't gonna, gonna make at particular schools. That's also where um, a lot of our AP, even AP Spanish is. Uh, be, again, because of the strength in numbers and being able to pull students together. Um, that, that school in general does this across content areas. So it, it is where we have many of the specialized career tech courses um, where students are really earning certifications um, in career tech areas that they can leave high school with and go get really great jobs because because they're able to take these upper level courses in those areas, but it's also in other content areas. So there are, um, in addition to the specialized career tech courses and pathways, there are um, a lot of the AP courses are at the career center that, that, might, that might, again, might not make at one particular high school, but when you pull them all together, it does. It also allows opportunity for upper level courses in many content areas, as well as language, for students that are, might be at smaller high schools where we know courses are not going to make. You know, AP statistics is not going to make at every high school. There's just not going to be enough students taking that. 
but that allows those students, just like you were saying with the language exchange at the higher ed level, it allows students to, to come together to that central location. So um, whether that's replicable, I have no idea, um, but uh, it is de definitely a unique offering we have in this district. As, as you schedule classes like that, are you trying to put them early in the morning? Are you putting them late in the afternoon? How are you getting students in and out of their home district schools? Because they don't become full-time students at the Career Center. Right, they don't. They usually spend maybe half their day there. It depends. Um, the way the schedule works, they'll take at least um, two classes at Career Center, uh, and they might take more. It just kind of depends. Um, sorry, I've got to plug in my, my laptop. No worries at all. Thank you for walking us through that. We've had a... Sorry about that, but, but we do offer... Um, uh, there's bus transportation during the day that goes back and forth from the career center to the home school. Uh, and then, of course, some students can drive, but they work out the schedule so that there's a travel period and they're able to do that. Thank you. That's really helpful. We've had a question in the chat actually bringing it back to the language exchange. Um, Letitia Guran is asking, what are some strategies you use to advertise the course through the language exchange? And I think that we can actually broaden this out, not just for languages on the exchange in the UNC system, but for Professor Pierre, how are we you know, promoting Haitian Creole to non-native speakers of Haitian Creole, non-heritage learners? How are we promoting some of these less commonly taught languages to make sure that it's not just um, heritage students who are choosing to enroll? That goes back to an earlier question that, that I had was getting advisors and, and counselors to accept that there are other kinds of languages out there and that, that it's not a threat if, if a student wants to take a different language, it, it's not a threat. I think students taking any language is a bonus to all languages. <laughs> it really is. I, and and uh, initially, when we first started out with the exchange, it, it, with the assembly and, and the exchange, there was a lot of, at, at, some, at some departments, the, the larger, I'll say it's the Spanish sections felt threatened that this was going to hurt their enrollments and so forth. And they saw it as a threat, which over the years now, I think they've, they've come to realize it's not a threat at all, that we're really helping each other and engaging and pushing language and, the, and, and pushing students into language. And it's, it's always a plus. It's not a, it's not a negative. And it's helped some departments even get minors and majors in languages that they haven't had before. So that's that's been the real plus there. How you advertise it, that's the big deal. I, it's and I and I think that one has to get to the level of the students and that's why that's why I say we're we're looking now into social media and that sort of thing because we can't just rely on counselors and advisors. We have to get the students themselves the information so that they can decide. But that's that's just at our, at our level of the exchange. So in, in my case, I used several strategies, first Twitter, Facebook, and then on campus, I hold, you know, different events. For example, uh, Haitian film series, I've been doing that, you know, for 10 years. I also hold like uh, International Queer Day. I've been doing that, you know, for nine years. And then a lot of events, you know, related, you know, to Haiti. And then while doing that, and I'm trying, you know, to introduce, you know, the language, you know, to everyone. Sometimes, you know, I hold events, you know, on campus. And then just, you know, for people who would like to know more about Haiti. I also, you know, contacted a lot of uh, professors, instructors, you know, on campus and then asked them if they can give me like two or three minutes to talk, you know, about, you know, my classes. And then all of that, it's kind of like, you know, a package. That's fantastic, thank you. And we've got another question in the Q&A, but before I turn to that, I wonder if I could um, pose a question for y'all to think on a bit. We've heard about an, an amazing range this evening of some of our less commonly taught languages, right? You know, thinking about how we're teaching Japanese at K-12, thinking about how we're teaching Czech and Slovak in community schools, thinking about how we're teaching Arabic, Haitian Creole and others at university level. I wonder if any of you would be brave enough to comment on less commonly taught languages in the state of North Carolina that we're still not serving to the level that we should. Um, what are some of the languages that we see in our populations that we don't have good coverage for community schools that we're not yet offering at the community college or university level? 
And if you have ideas about how your experience in the languages that you all know best might serve those underserved languages in our state. That's a big one. Feel free to chew on it. I might bring it well, back to you in a minute. Oh, sure. We're going to chew on it. We're going to talk about it right now. <laughs> Feel free if you're brave. Well, it just came to my mind right away because it's, it's so relevant and in the news is Afghanistan and languages of Afga Af Afghanistan, right? Um, I've had multiple requests for speakers of Dari or Pashtun, and, and it makes sense that people would reach out to me as the Arabic instructor. And I say, I really don't know where to go. And I think that's one that I'd love to, to see development for um, because there are refugees from Afghanistan coming into communities, communities in North Carolina. And uh, those languages are much needed and I think will continue to be. So that's my first thought right there. Absolutely. So when and Korean, Korean is always a big, that people are asking for Korean all the time, not necessarily because the population is there, but the students coming in from high school and, and whatever, I guess, K-pop and whatever else there is, they're, they're just all turned on by Korean and would love to study Korean. And that's one thing we, we've just gotten in on, uh, Greensboro is now offering Korean at the 101 level. And so we have some students that can take that, but it not, not, to, not the numbers that we have students asking for it. So that's, that's one language. The other language I think that we always get interest in is Turkish and Turkish is not I, I, on, at least at, at our campus, I've had a lot of interest in Turkish and we don't do Turkish. So. Yeah, fascinating. Um, I think Professor Turner has raised a very good point that a lot of the refugee communities that we've welcomed into North Carolina, um, and we can be you know, proud for what we have been able to do as Southerners with our hospitality, we can still aspire to do better. Um, so being able to support the languages of our Vietnamese refugee communities who've been here for quite some time. More recently, we have, we've had large waves of refugees from Burma. And these are not languages that we are supporting at our universities or community colleges, and certainly not yet in our K through 12 schools. Marta? Yes, uh, just something came to mind right before you said that. Uh, so communi um, community uh, colleges uh, are not necessarily the kind of institutions that we think of uh, offering foreign language instruction, but they are the institutions serving these populations. So those schools will would be um, the, it would be a treasure to work with those ESL, EFL, uh, any other programs uh, that have these direct links to these communities. Because you've asked your question, what should we do better for what communities? And and I don't know because I don't even know what communities are here because they are not quite loud enough or they don't cause enough troubles for us to know you know it's just hard to figure out so we really again we are on here the experts you know we still i still don't know what languages are here what communities are here and who needs what help i know there is um uh, at, at the university uh, in greensboro you can see greensboro isn't there some sort of center for refugee i don't know if that's a statewide situ statewide um uh, organization they might also know so kind of again connecting these various entities and uh, figuring, how, figuring out how to work together would be great because if we get to the communities, they can tell us, but we have to ask first. Yes. Absolutely. We've got two other questions that have come in and I'd love to toss them out before we wrap this up. Um, first from Kim Freeman in the Q&A, she's asking, are there summer programs for teachers to learn a new language? Um, she's in Guilford County Schools and would love to learn um, Spanish, but I think we've got teachers on here from across the state who would be interested in languages. Can anyone recommend summer programs for language learning when teachers aren't in the classroom? So let me start with Haitian Creole. If people are interested in learning Haitian Creole, there's a summer program at Florida International University. It's been going there like, it's been going on for almost like 25 years. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking, you know, of offering Haitian Creole uh, this coming summer to at Duke. And of course, a lot of the universities have summer classes, uh, either summer one or summer two, and Spanish is taught all the time in summer at, at the various uh, universities so that there would be, uh, there would be that I think even more so now there are even some some distance programs in the summer so you can you can either choose to take it take it online or come to the campus but there are a number of of uh, distance programs so that you don't have to yeah 
Thank you all. Let me also pose a question that's come in from Stephanie Morgan in the chat. And she asks, in thinking about how to encourage non-heritage learners to pursue less commonly taught languages, how important is making connections between culture, history, and the present in helping to engage those non-heritage learners? How feasible would some kind of cross-curricular or cross-listed course section be in some cases? I'll pipe up and say, it's very, I think it's very important to, to make those connections. Um, and one thing in, here at UNCW I've done with, with the Arabic courses is to try to draw in students who were interested in the Middle East or religion or other things that kind of intersect with Arabic as a language of study and to draw them in by partly requiring Arabic to be a core course. And so I, we have a Middle Eastern studies minor here. Um, that I reconfigured and made Arabic the core. So you take that and the course itself, yeah, it's labeled a language course, but it really is a language and culture course. Um, a lot like Jacques was talking about his um, Haitian Creole course. You know, we, we reserve certain days to really just talk, go in depth on cultural concepts. But I don't, I don't, I don't think you can just teach a pure language course, especially, uh, maybe not any language. I don't think it's fair to say there's any language you can really separate from the culture. Um, especially in the case of Arabic, a lot of students really don't have any clue what, in, what countries are in the Arab world or what we mean by Arab as an ethnicity, right? And so we kind of have to dive into those questions as we go through the language itself. And, uh, I think they're inherently tied together. Um, as far as cross-listing a course, um, I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure what she means there, but maybe she could specify uh, further. Thanks. We'd love to get that in from Stephanie if she wants to respond. Um, I have a couple of announcements before we hit 8.30, um, but Ruth, I wondered if you had any more questions that you wanted to pose to the panel. No, I think we, we hit, we hit the, what we had, had planned to talk about and uh, I'll, let, I'll leave it to you, Kevin. Well, it was such a great conversation. I really enjoyed bringing folks together across these different um, venues for language learning, right? Uh, not just the K through 12 school systems, our community schools, and then looking at the higher education level as well. Thinking about how we can create continuity across these and how we can be supporting a broader, a broader range of languages for the students of North Carolina. This is just the first of two expert conversations that we're gonna have this week. Um, I'm just tossing into the chat now, the registration link to join us on Thursday when we'll have some experts talk about teaching for heritage language learners and the growing uh, dual language immersion programs in our state. Again, we'll have experts from higher education. We'll have folks in K through 12. We'll have different kinds of um, language backgrounds in that too. Um, I am uh, reminded by my colleague, Dr. Anne-Marie Gunter, the World Languages Consultant at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction that in North Carolina, Chinese is no longer a less commonly taught language. Um, it is a more commonly taught language and is growing in not only heritage learners, but also dual language immersion. So we hope that many of you all will be able to join us for that conversation on Thursday. This has been a program run by the um, Department of Public Instruction of North Carolina, along with the Area Study Centers at Duke and UNC. And we are so proud to be able to support every year a competition for language learners at the high school level um, to practice their language skills in discussing real world issues. That's called learning through languages. If you're interested to hear what our students have um, achieved and to see those results tomorrow, uh, that'll be live streamed from our YouTube channel tomorrow at 4 p.m. And you can find that from areastudies.unc.edu, which will also be in the chat. I think it now falls to me to thank our panel, um, to Professor Ruth Gross of NC State for chairing us this evening, uh, to Dr. Leslie Baldwin of Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, um, Dr. Marta McCabe, who runs, who founded and now runs the Czechoslovak School of North Carolina. Professor Michael Turner is with us from UNC Wilmington where he teaches in the Arabic program. And of course, Professor Jacques Pierre is teaching Haitian Creole at Duke. Because this is a webinar, our uh, panelists can't actually hear the uproarious applause coming from across the entire state um, for their contributions this evening, but I'm very grateful. And on behalf of the Duke UNC Area Study Centers, let me say thank you. And we hope that we'll see you all on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.